The second solo run I ever did on my channel was about two years ago and it was Cubone. And today, we're gonna give its evolution Marowak its own solo run in Pokemon Red and Blue. The ground typing, it's notorious for having a rough time in solo runs. When you're weak to Misty, Erica, Lorelei, and the multiple late game Gyarados running around in those big battles, you oftentimes have to rely on good coverage and hopefully some good stats to have a good run. And Marowak, honestly, just doesn't really have any of those things. If we look at the stats, you can see that most of Marowak's budget was put into defense, and it's not really the most useful solo run stat, and the rest suffer as a result. 50 base special and 45 base speed will make those fights much harder, and unlike something like Rhydon that has one of the highest attacks in the entire game, here we just have an average 80 to work with. As for the learn set, it's kind of what you would expect from an average Pokemon in Gen 1. It's pretty much all normal moves outside of its two signature moves, and we'll go over those in a second, but there's just really nothing that exciting here. For the TM learn set, it might look like you have something interesting going on here. You have water moves, you got ice moves, but when you think about its poor special and the fact that most grass Pokemon also carry the poison topping, you'd be better served with things like a neutral earthquake in pretty much every situation. And the glaring one huge sore thumb that sticks out here is the lack of rock slide. Now sure, things like dig, body slam, earthquake, they're all really great, but at the end of the day, we're still pretty much butt naked against the handful of Gyarados will be facing and today my friends that's what I like to call an issue. Also if you want to see the full learn set this is your opportunity. You can pause the video, you can look over it, you can do whatever you have to do because it will be condensed into more relevant things to the run on the actual sidebar. Now some of you want to see the full learn set, I get it, but the problem is that it simply wouldn't fit without being ant sized and I think this is the best compromise. And before we hop into this run fully I'd like to quickly say that if you enjoy solo run content and you want to help the channel out, like and comments they go a long way and they're much appreciated i love interacting with you guys whether you're someone new maybe someone who normally just doesn't think about that sort of thing or maybe if you're a returning subscriber like gabe k i want to ask you guys a question this week executor at the moment is the last ranked evolved pokemon run and it has a time around four hours with 29 resets and i want to know if you think that marowak will take over that spot a yes or no will be fine but elaboration is cool too and if not what do you think the worst evolved run will be when everything's said and done and the tier list is complete because it's pretty fascinating to me. And with that out of the way, I think you can just sit back, relax, you can grab yourself that sodi pop, and I think we can just get to work today. As for the first rival battle, we do get to see the starting moves. We have three supportive moves. Leer pretty much is the only useful thing. And then we have our first signature move in Bone Club. Now we missed the first turn. We'll go into more detail about that in a second. But pretty much like I said earlier, most grass tops carry the poison type as well so it's neutral damage. Bulbasaur is no exception here and it does enough to get us past this one. But let's talk about Bone Club and the signature moves in general for the cube online. Now this is kind of an exclusive middle of the road ground type that has a pretty respective 65 base power and on top of that it has a 10% chance to flinch the opponent. Now if that was it the move would be great but the caveat here is the 85% accuracy and you know what they say if it doesn't have 100% accuracy it has 50% accuracy. And you can see from the opening rifle battle earlier, I missed a couple of times and that alone, and it's going to be a reoccurring theme. It's rather annoying. Marowak also gets a second signature move in Bone Meringue. Now, I'm going to cover this one now because you learn it really late and it's not going to see a single use in this playthrough. This move is very cool in the conceptual sense. You're throwing a bone and it's coming back to you. It's hitting twice. And I greatly wish that you would learn this one earlier or that it was just a little bit better. Now, as it stands now, a 50 base power ground move that hits twice basically makes it exactly the same as Earthquake. This means the fact that it only has 90% accuracy compared to Earthquake's 100 and the fact that we pick up Earthquake long before we'll be level 48 just kind of leaves it out in the cold and that's honestly a shame. I think if they gave it 55 base power or maybe added some sort of effect to this or really just did anything to make it stand out it would be a nice alternative and something that's just unique to Marowak but it is what it is. Marowak's overall design process in Generation 1 is kind of strange 
to me. Counting its evolutionary line, there's only four other Pokemon lines in Gen 1 with more than one signature move. Now it feels like initially there were some people that really liked this Pokemon and they thought enough of it to give it those moves, but then maybe someone came up behind them and made all the moves worse and then removed all its coverage moves from its learn set. And that's just really speculation on my part, but it's clear there were some changes made because you could just look at its back sprite. There's additional bones sticking out of its spine and that's clearly not the final product we see in the game. And I just kind of find that sort of thing interesting because we'll never fully know the truth. But looking ahead, I am going to battle all the bug types. We can see that back sprite I just talked about. And something after doing a few Marowak runs, something that you'll learn is the importance of Leer. That's because bug resists ground type. And since this is your only damaging move, it's not going to hit every time. You have to make pretty heavy use of Leer overall just to smooth things out. Since Leer has 100% accuracy, it's more efficient to do things like triple Leer into a bone club to hit rather than trying to use five or six bone clubs uh, that are just resisted. It's specifically bad against things like Metapod that use Harden, but I'm really not going to touch on it too much. Overall, in red and blue, Viridian Force just has more Weedle evolutionary line Pokemon to fight, and since they are half poison topping, that just means you have a little bit of an easier time, but there's not much to talk about here. We finished the three trainers, and now we can take a look at Brock. Now going into this one, I have to do a few ground type runs coming up to the summer, and I chose Marowak because it looked on paper like it would have the easiest time early, and it really does. Having a super effective ground move, along with Leer if you really need it, really helps, and you don't even have to battle the optional trainers to make it past Brock, so it just gives you a little added insurance. Now overall, this one isn't too clean, I do take a pretty good bit of damage, and this fight isn't 100% consistent, but today, we do make it past on the first time, and there's not really much more to talk about as far as Brock goes. Going towards Mount Moon, there's really not a whole lot to say, but I will tell you a story about one of my previous runs. I had a really early reset here that I did not see coming at all. I had mentioned how Metapod was pretty annoying, and I made it to this bug catcher right here with about eight uses of Bone Club left. I wasn't quite onto the Leer strategy yet to stretch out my uses of Bone Club, and I kind of played it loose. I was just testing things out, and what ended up happening is I ran out of Bone Clubs. I missed one too many times, and it's resisted, and when I ran out, I had exactly 93 PP of other moves to run out. Now, I took a reset, and if you want to know why, if you think about it, every turn takes about 3 seconds, and if you multiply the 3 seconds by 93, and then you take into account that I'm playing on times 3 speed, and that's roughly 3 seconds of in-game time for every 1 second in real life. You take your 33 and a third chance! Minus my 25% chance, and you got an 8 and a third chance of winning. It was going to be about a 14 minute battle. It was kind of like my own personal hell. I didn't know what to think about it. I did take the reset because I was like, man, this is taking quite a while. But I just thought I would mention it because it's kind of funny that I was locked into this five minute long hellacious battle with this Metapod trying to use 93 moves worth just to get to struggle. It was awful, and I thought I would bring it up. In Mount Moon, Merwite kind of in a unique position because I had has a ground move and a really high defense, so it's in a great position to take on three optional battles that give a lot of experience here. I do take on the Super Nerd. I mentioned him a lot, but I can also take on the Hiker that has the Onyx and two Geodudes, as well as the Raticate Rocket Grunt that you normally would never touch in a solo run because it's too risky, but Marowak handles it pretty well. I do learn Mega Punch. Uh, this was before the Hiker, but I spliced it later just so it made more sense when I was talking, but Mega Punch finally gives Marowak the ability to actually hit flying type Pokemon, and that's pretty important considering we have a few coming up. At the end of Mount Moon, it puts me at level 17. Now originally I was shooting for level 18, maybe 19, maybe even 20, and when we got to this optimized run and we looked at all the damage numbers, it just really didn't matter. It was kind of a hopeless cause. Level 17 was the sweet spot and about the best you needed to do. For rival number 3, you're not outspeeding the Pidgeotto unless you're at least level 19, and I cannot afford to use candies this early. Level 18 also doesn't put Mega Punch in a two-shot range either, so my strategy here was to go straight Mega Punch and pretty much let Jesus take the wheel and hope I don't miss too much or take a sand attack. Now, I do take a sand attack pretty much immediately on the second turn. And when you have two 85% accurate moves, this can be absolutely dreadful, and it was in practice, but here, miraculously, I pretty much hit every single move until we get to the Bulbasaur. Now, reality kicks in, and 
I start to take some super effective damage. If things aren't looking good, but the AI decides to start spamming Growl, it keeps giving me opportunities. I keep missing for a while, but then at the very last moment, Marowak here decides to go in with its 8% crit chance, crit with the Bone Club, and I take the battle on the very first attempt. And that's just amazing to me. That's a great stroke of luck. As far as Nugget Bridge goes, I battle a couple of extra trainers here, the two hikers. Now originally I was doing this so that I could pull the second trainer down so that I could get access to Seismic Toss. It was pretty big, pretty crucial in the Cubone run and it was something I did for a couple of runs during testing. And until this final optimized run, I was just convinced I was going to need it, but it turns out you actually don't. It's very important, it's a huge upgrade to get Dig, but the main thing here is that I cannot take on Miss yet and I have to skip her. This is the first time in a long while that I've had to do this, but it's really not surprising considering everything I've already talked about. Now we can take it down to the SSN and there's a little bit of a shakeup with Marowak's run. Now the start is going to be standard. We're going to pick up Body Slam. Then I go downstairs, I pick up things like the Max Potion and the Ether, and then I battle one Sailor that has a single shelter and that really smooths out the experience going forward. Now we're going to leave the SSN and we're going to backtrack to Route 11. This is something you don't see very often unless a Pokemon really struggles with Misty. Overall here I do seven battles and it's really nice because most of these Pokemon here are really weak to ground. It's very fast. It's very efficient. When that's done I do pick up the rare candy. Let's not talk about that. Instead let's take a look at rival number three. And I'm gonna highlight this battle because Body Slam and Dig just make a world of difference here. Now I don't one shot the Pidgeotto but it does make this one a lot faster and with these new moves I can essentially just mow down the entire team with no issues, but guys remember we had to skip Misty and she's coming up next. A couple of levels before this, you do start outspeeding the star you. We're a little past that, it doesn't matter. What matters is that it's a one shot, it's not an issue. Now here you have multiple win conditions against the star me. If it goes straight water guns and it doesn't crit, you win. If you crit, you win. If it uses an X defend turn one rather than an attack, you win. Overall, what I'm trying to say is that you have a decent success chance at this level, and even though we don't outspeed, we just don't see Bubble Beam connect this run. This one's not too bad, and the first big hurdle of the run is over, but it did take significant extra battles up to this point to get past that. So from here, that means we're going to do the minimum track. Rock Tunnel is skippable, and I think we can just pick back up in Celadon. The first order of business to do is to go ahead and take on the Rocket Hideout. Now, I do pick up the two PP ups here and I'm picking up the high money items like the HP up. I also get the rare candy. Then there's a nugget. And then on the final floor before Giovanni, there is an iron. And as far as Giovanni goes, he's pretty much weak to ground. We kind of just mow through him. Kangaskhan takes a few hits, but it's Giovanni number one. And with like most runs, there's not much to really say about it. After that, it's time for the first Celadon Mart buy. Now I'm coming here really early because I do need access to Saffron because we have to backtrack to get to Surge because we skipped Missy earlier and we need to get Fly ASAP so that maybe we can get this run back on track. Now after haggling, buying, and selling, I'm able to afford three proteins and three carbos here and vitamin management will be absolutely key for this run but it's not really going to be relevant until later. Next I pick up Fly, I truck it through Saffron and I don't even bother to heal. Now this is because I'm a ground type and Surge is already kind of a weak trainer as it is and we held off on him. Now if you don't know, in red and blue versions, Surge's Raichu only has electric moves, so even if I'm at only 5 HP, there's hardly any way that I could actually lose this battle. Now with the access to fly, if we can kind of get this run back on track, first up is Pokemon Tower, and today we actually need to take a look at rival number 3. Body Slam and Dig, they're good enough for everything here, but the main thing is this is our first Gyarados of the run, and from here on out, Hydro Pump crits will be an instant reset no matter what. Here we do get hit with the Hydro Pump. It takes us very low, but I'm still fine. I can finish the fight overall. Now, 
originally this is something else I said in a video a long time ago I said why does this Gyarados have Hydro Pump and it's because when you're looking at Pokemon trainers have they don't care about the pre-evolution and if you look at Gyarados's starting moveset he has Hydro Pump at level one if you were to put it like in a solo run like in this setting so that's why he has Hydro Pump I thought I'd mention it here but we can move on the rest of Pokemon Tower not worth covering once we're done with that it's straight down to the Safari Zone there are a couple of vitamins here there's a protein and a carbos that I want to get and I want to use and there's also the final HMs of the run when we're done with that we're keeping it in fuchsia and the first thing I do here is I go over to this house and then you don't see this very often but here I pick up a good rod and then we can just take a look at Koga and we're just gonna destroy it Marowak does have its shortcomings but it's still a ground type we still have dig and it's gonna absolutely eat Koga for breakfast next up I'm gonna go catch a water type with a fishing rod and that's insignificant it doesn't matter but what I want to say here is that I'm the most unlucky fisherman in the Kanto region I get the not even a nibble prompt so many times but we do get our surf user and after this point the game starts to reach the next phase now from here on out there's gonna be an extreme amount of grinding and I'll keep you guys kind of updated on what we are doing but we can't possibly show it all but it's gonna start right here in Erica's gym and I'm gonna be taking out every single extra trainer in here outside of the execute beauty because who wants to deal with that it has hypnosis it's very annoying so everything else gets taken out and when that's all said and done it's time for Erica now here I'm just over leveled now unlike having problems with Misty you really can't bypass that for too long you have to go back eventually now Erica's placement in the game it just allows you to kind of work around her much more efficiently and even though she's a really tough gym leader if you are weak to grass the truth is that this is often how runs like that look now the key thing here as you might expect is that I'm already in that range where you can just one shot the victory bell and this one does look really easy but let me assure you guys you see the optimized runs in my playthroughs but this was probably the most threatening fight in the run and don't let how easy it looked here fool you now in this little segment we're gonna be doing some really tight stat experience and item management here I'm gonna dip into Sylph just get my toes wet just a little bit real quick now the main things here are going to the 10th floor and picking up that Carbos. It's really important here because our stat experience is getting really close to being capped out. And outside of that, it is time for Earthquake. I don't need to sing Earthquake's praise. 100 base power, it's a stabbed move in this run. It's absolutely key. And I do have three PP ups to make grinding that we're gonna be doing ahead a little bit more efficient coming up. And then after that, I do go to the fifth floor. I take out the Arbok Grunt and then I get the protein. And after I do that, I dig out and we're done with seal for now. Now after that, I'm actually gonna be doing a second Celadon buy today. Here, I'm gonna get one more protein, one more Carbos, and I get two Calciums. That slightly helps my defenses. It's gonna help against the Hydro Pumps and the Ice Moves that we're eventually gonna run into. Now I do use them all now, but it's worth noting that I am holding off on the Carbos for a second, and we'll get to that. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the most brisk of swims down to Cinnabar. And today we're gonna be doing kind of a lot extra. Now, in Pokemon Mansion, for the first time ever, I'm gonna do some extra trainers in here, but these first couple are gonna be for a very specific reason. After this scientist right here, there is a Carbos. We pick it up a lot, often for most runs, but right here, battling the scientist puts me into a range where when I use my final Carbos, I'm about 100 stat experience from the range where vitamins are no longer effective. Now, this might seem insignificant to put this much thought into vitamins but there is one kind of key part in the game where this little extra bit of speed is gonna matter and honestly I think it's fun to optimize runs this way if you think it's a little bit too tedious then just let the professionals handle it bud there's still a couple of extra battles down in the basement and we're still not done after that once we make it to Blaine's gym we're gonna be battling every single trainer inside of there and we don't even have to answer questions today but just to keep it going we're gonna answer the age-old question of if Tombstoner, brother. 
is actually TM28 or not. I need to know. And as far as Blaine goes, we could probably just skip him, but I know there's going to be somebody in the comments that are just in an uproar, making a huge hissy fit that I didn't show every single battle in detail. But brother, what do you want me to say? I'm a ground type. I have crazy ground moves. Everything's weak to it. It's over in seconds. I mean, I don't know what you want from me. This one's over. It's done with. We can move on. Now we can head back to Sylph, and rather than doing the fighting dojo, I did decide to take on about 99% of the trainers here, and it's totally not because I forgot the fighting dojo existed. Overall here, I concocted a pretty efficient route where I start on the 8th floor, and I start to make my way down systematically, and I start taking everything out. Overall, this is kind of boring. Most of the things are a one-shot, and a lot of them are weak to ground moves. And when it's all said and done, there are a total of 22 extra battles in Sylph, and when I'm done here, I do hit level 52 going into rival number 5. Obviously this fight was hard because I had to level up so much, but it's like the sea parted and everything came up millhouse for this run. The key thing to start out the fight is Pidgeot misses the sand attack. That's great. I love it. We take it out. And then the second thing that's very fortuitous for us is that Gyarados misses the Hydro Pump, so we're just in a way better position than we ever really thought we would be. Now from there it doesn't matter, because the Growlithe, we got Alakazam, at this level we outspeed it, and it's worth noting that I could tank a Razor Leaf. Considering how the start of the battle went, I didn't take any damage, but to cap off this lucky battle, I just get a crit with Earthquake, and that's a done deal. Now, I need to stress that this fight was insanely difficult. The fact that I had to level up so high is kind of a testament to that, and I really just can't get it through to you guys enough how oppressive Gyarados can be if you're just weak to it, and then Razor Leaf being on top of it is just a huge hurdle to overcome as well. And even though this one looked easy, it's kind of like Eric it did take a lot of planning. Now let's skip ahead to after Sylph. The first thing I do here is I go ahead and I pick up the TM4 Mimic and in Sabrina's Gym I need just a little tiny baby bit of experience here for the end game so I do take on a trainer in her gym. Now just like with Pokemon Mansion this is something that you're never gonna see in my runs and it was something kind of unique and I did want to mention it. As for Sabrina I outspeed the first few Pokemon and Alakazam even gets a crit on me but since her Alakazam doesn't no psychic it doesn't matter i tank it and we finish off this badge fairly easy now my friends we have just one gym remaining and marowak is still on its path to train for that end game so i am gonna battle everything that i can in giovanni's gym once again there's all standard here as for giovanni it's just straight earthquake i do take a sand attack from doug trio and that's kind of annoying it outspeeds me but marowak just wasn't phased at all and since you get a badge boost from sand attack we just use it, it helps us out and we can just easily take everything out with pretty much a single hit. And before we go into rival number six, I do learn Mimic here and it's pretty important. This is a strategy that a lot of Pokemon can utilize in red and blue specifically to make rival number six not as oppressive and we'll just go over it real quick. My experience and the way I have this fight planned out is that I'll level up after the Gyarados. The fight has a simple premise. I can tank a Hydro Pump, but let's not overlook the first couple of Pokemon. Now the key thing here, I talk about this a lot, is this is the point in the game where the Pidgeotto doesn't have sand attack anymore, so it's really no longer a threat considering our high defense. And the same thing goes for the Rhyhorn. It, it's never a threat unless you're playing Voltorb. And we can just overall get through these first two Pokemon rather quickly. We all know that it's Gyarados. That's the problem. Now, I have a really high chance to two-shot this thing. It's roughly 40%. You can see it here on the damage numbers. And on the very first attempt here, I just don't get the range. It barely survives. I'm talking like this thing survives with just six health and it takes me out and that's our very first reset for the run now before we even go any further let me just say that marowak not having any resets until this point was something that i could not fathom when i was practicing it at first so hats off to marowak it did pretty good to make it this far and on the next attempt just to remind us to bring us back down to reality we get crit by hydro pump and honestly there's nothing you can do about that we're gonna lose every single battle that we get crit with a hydro 
water pump, so maybe this will be the last time we see it in the video. On the third attempt, I don't get the two shot, but I get some miraculous luck. I paralyze at turn one, and it gets two straight turns of being fully paralyzed, and that gives me a free victory here. And I guess looking back at the run, I probably relied on that 40% chance to two shot a little bit too much, but it was the best I could do given the circumstances and the Pokemon. Anyway, I level up after that, and now it's our old dear friend, our little pathetic puppy Growlithe. He exists here for one reason. I want to take agility, and I want to fully set up. And from that point, I outspeed the Alakazam now with the agility boost. I can one-shot it, and we have a pretty decent chance to one-shot the Venusaur with an earthquake, and that's what happens here. And overall, this battle really wasn't that bad. It's Gyarados. What can you do? Let's just lick our wounds and move on to tougher challenges ahead. And if you guys thought it was Elite Four time already, then you would be wrong. Now, I have the luxury of the foresight here to know Marowak's shortcomings and struggles, and this is the optimized run, and I got this Marowak in the gym seven days a week, pumping iron, preparing for life struggles, and the training is not done just yet. I actually battle a ton of trainers here, and like always, I'm not going to show every battle. Now, there's 10 trainers total here, and I specifically love this one cool trainer. It does lead with a Parasect. It's kind of annoying. It's an issue. It can spore you. I did clinch a little bit. The Dugong actually crit me, but when you make it to the end of this fight, the Chansey is worth it. It gives you so much experience. It's so good when you can actually take this battle on. I do finish this segment just at level 72 on the final trainer, and going into the league, I'm using 10 of my 11 rare candies, and that's going to get me to level 72. Obviously, we do still have multiple Gyarados waiting in the wings at the end of this, and we have the Ice Specialist Lorelei waiting first, but let's just see how my optimizations play out, and let's see if this is kind of a clean run, or if we have kind of like a ride-on situation where we have 20 resets on Lorelei. On Lorelei, we get to see the plan in action. Earthquake can one-shot the Dugong, but after that, the Cloister is really tanky. It can survive the first Earthquake. It does hit us back for some pretty decent super effective damage. It's really not that much, and then I take it out. Now, the rest of the fight is going to be trivial. You guys already know the strategy. I have Mimic. I'm going to take Amnesia, and I'm going to use it three times. This does a couple of things for us. It puts the Jinx into a guaranteed one-shot range, but most importantly, we outspeed it. Now, the Lapras has a really good chance of going down as well, but here we get a little unlucky, it survives, but a retroactive potion ends the fight pretty clean, and that's a really huge threat of the run down. Now, we're not going to heal, we're not going to do anything extra, we're going to go straight, we're going to take a quick break on our old pal Bruno, and all you really need to know for this fight is Earthquake. We just go straight Earthquake, and it's over before you know it. It's Bruno, another week. I would say overall, Bruno's like the Friday of the Elite Four, of the run, like you know you have a little break for the most part, but let's stop talking about him. Let's move on. Now it's time for Agatha, and it's been a little bit since we've seen a stabbed ground move used on her, and it's going to be glorious today, especially since all the extra training and all the extra levels that we need for the next couple of fights allow us to outspeed everything but the final Gengar. This means that this one's pretty much a series of one-shots. The Golbat could be annoying if he uses things like Haze or Confuse Ray. It can kind of stall out the fight, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You guys already know my thoughts on the final Gengar here. I think it's pretty trash. It's got a really awful learn set and you just, it, it's pretty easy. We got Earthquake, we can smash this one and now it's time to talk about Gyarados. And the thing that makes Lance's Gyarados so hard, I don't know if anyone's ever stated this, it's kind of obvious, is that it's up front. It's right there in your face. You can't do anything about it. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This one is awful. Now, let me be a total nerd here. Let me show the damage numbers again. I should have around a 65, 66% chance to two-shot it, and that's really good, I think. And I just don't think I could make this fight more consistent without sacrificing even more time. Overall, I think I got pretty unlucky here. On the first attempt, I just get straight soloed. It often happens this way. Here's how it goes. I'll miss the two-shot range. It'll get off a Hydro Pump, get a Hyper Potion, and then it just finishes me off with a Hydro Pump. That's what happens on attempt number one. On attempt number two, it looks like I got the two-shot range, but of course, he's just going to crit on a Hydro Pump. And like we said last time, what can he do? And on the next two resets, I have two two more here both end up the same exact way either I get the two shot range or maybe it misses a hydro pump I make it past the Gyarados but I am around 60 to 75 health and I just get taken out later in the fight because I just don't have enough juice left in the tank 
And I'll be the first to admit, maybe I did overlook this fight. Maybe I seen that 65% chance to two shot the Gyarados and I thought, eh, it's good enough. And overall, four resets, really? I guess it's not that bad at the end of the day. Now on the final fight, I do hit some godlike luck. And I think looking back, watching the footage, doing the editing, I think you do need some luck for this fight to go well. What ends up happening is I hit that two shot range and it misses the Hydro Pump. That means I make it through to the next Pokemon unscathed and that's pretty much the best position you could ever hope to be in. Now I'm gonna level up after this Dragonair, but I can go ahead just to save some turns on the next one. I go ahead and I mimic agility before taking it out. When we level up, now's that our time to set up that agility and we do take some damage here but with these boosts and the really high base defense, look how little this hyper beam does to us. It kind of makes me happy, but overall we're set up and that allows me to actually make it through the fight. It's pretty key here because you really don't have an answer for the Aerodactyl. You have to use resisted body slams. It does take a while, but the agilities do help you out a lot. And as for the Dragonite, those agilities do put you in a guaranteed two shot range. That is unless it uses barrier like it does here and it just kind of prolongs the inevitable and I take it out and that's Lance down. Only four resets. I'm happy with it. After the battle, I have one more rare candy and I guess it's worth noting that I could have just used the candy before Lance. Maybe that would have made the Gyarados a little better, but I felt like I absolutely needed it to make this champion fight a little better. And with that said, let's just kind of dive into the final battle. And here's how this attempt went. A turn one body slam into a mirror move body slam that paralyzes me. That absolutely destroys pretty much any shot I have in this battle. And just for kicks and giggles, I guess, I try to play this one out. Maybe I try to fish for some boost on the ride on, but overall the paralysis means that I'm slower and I get humiliated here. It opens me up for a horn drill and I get the one hit KO put on me. And that's a pretty embarrassing reset. I mean, come on, the mirror move into to the paralysis it's like the ai had perfect scripts but i'm not gonna stay stuck on this one let's move on to the next attempt looking ahead i do not get paralyzed this time that's fantastic news i take it out in a couple of body slams and we move on to the alakazam and here i'm not even gonna waste a turn mimicking recover i'm going straight damage it doesn't use any damage on me i take it out with an earthquake and that means we're moving on to the radon at full health and that's pretty much the exact position that you want to be in as for the radon I do want to fish for some boost. Now, three boost is what you really want here. But overall, I can pretty much only use body slam if I want to just chip it down real slow. I guess I could mimic fury attack or something weak like that. But at the end of the day, I take it out before I get three badge boost. I only have two. And let's kind of see how that affects the battle going forward. Finally, on our last Gyarados of the run, once again, everything's coming up millhouse. The two boosts definitely make me two shot this one now. And it misses high hydro pump and that makes things even better. After that, there's a weak to ground Arcanine just sitting there. He's the appetizer, but Papa's ready for some dinner. And without three boosts, Venusaur is not a guaranteed one shot, but it's really close. It survives, it gets one chance, but it only goes for a pathetic mega drain and I'm able to close out this run after a pretty dominant champion fight. And that's it. Marowak has done it. And I have to admit, this run, kind of like with something like Voltorb, was actually much better than I originally anticipated. Now, I don't know whether to praise how efficiently I routed in all the extra trainers without costing a lot of time or to praise the Pokemon. But I do think it was a solid run nonetheless. But there's some very clear flaws at the end of the day. Marowak finishes with a level of 75, 7 resets, and a final end game time of 3 3 hours, 53 minutes, and 25 seconds. Now if we look at the final time with the resets, and then we kind of take a look at the tier list, I'd say that Marowak overall performed slightly worse than Moltres. Now I'm going to put it last in the B tier for now, but the main takeaway here is that it's actually not the worst evolved Pokemon when I thought that it might be by a pretty large margin. I think the resets are what kind of surprises me the most. Outside of Gyarados, we would only have 
one reset for the entire run, and that was a very, very, very unlucky mirror move body slam uh, paralysis battle on the champion. Two of the Gyarados resets were crits, and overall, I would say I was a little unlucky because I just could not get the two-shot range on those body slams. Despite having a fairly high chance, everything was carefully crafted, but it was just not my run for a perfect one. And that's just how the dice roll sometimes. I'm fine with that. And as always, I'm going to say special thanks to my channel members. I appreciate the support, and I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to stop showing the full list because I have got to get ahead because I'm there's a lot of stuff coming up. A lot of changes in the old life, a uh, vacation coming up, and I just don't want to miss a video drop, so I don't want to date my videos by having old members on here anymore. But I appreciate you. I love you. I'll interact with you. Comment. I'll shout you out. And if you've made it this far and you aren't subscribed, you probably should be because I need more subscribers like you that just stick around to the end of the video. People who hear me talking right now are the real MVPs because they really get my retention time up and that's pretty much one of the key factors in YouTube recommending the video to other people. But I think that's all I have for you guys. Maybe we'll be taking it back to Crystal version next week, but you never know. Maybe we'll be seeing a starter. I don't know. Who knows? And I'll see you guys then, I guess. Bye.